for rigid rotor we have uh, discussed how one can set up Schrodinger equation starting from the uh, square of angular momentum operator and we have uh, worked out the phi dependent part and we have given you the answer for the theta dependent part and the answer we have discussed is the wave function essentially is spherical harmonics theta phi is equal to the theta dependent part multiplied by phi dependent part and now we can talk about what is j and what is m. This capital M is something that arises out of solution of your uh, phi dependent part of the equation. Remember capital phi turned out to be a multiplied by e to the power i m phi. What is a? We will work out in the assignments. What does m stand for? It stands for the uh, z component of angular momentum. What are the allowed values? 0, plus minus 1, plus minus 2 and so on and so forth. Yeah. What is j? j is another quantum number that comes when we work out the theta dependent part. Also do not forget that j the theta dependent part and phi dependent part are related by this m square. So, it also gives us a limit to the value of capital M. Okay. So, j turns out to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, 0 and positive integers and uh, the limit of uh, capital M turns out to be j. All right. So, if j equal to uh, 3 for example, you can have m equal to 0 plus minus 1 plus minus 2 plus minus 3. So, we have 2j plus 1 values of m. Okay. We will come back to this once again when we talk about hydrogen atom. The theta dependent part is uh, basically a constant multiplied by a uh, an associated legendary polynomial in cos theta. Okay, that is what it is. So, the theta dependent part is uh, a polynomial and the phi dependent part is an imaginary exponential term factor. Okay. Now, uh, what happens when we uh, try to find the energy? For that we go back to total angular momentum. We are going to discuss uh, angular momentum and its component in a little more detail uh, in the next module. For now just believe me when I write when the square of angular momentum operator operates on the spherical polar harmonics uh, when the uh, it operates on spherical harmonics I get back the same spherical harmonics wave function multiplied by its corresponding uh, eigen value h cross square multiplied by j into j plus 1. So, total angular momentum is h cross square multiplied by j into j plus 1. How did we obtain the Hamiltonian? We obtained the Hamiltonian by dividing the square of angular momentum operator by 2i. So, uh, that 2i is essentially a constant for the molecule. So, I can very simply write this the Hamiltonian is L square by 2 mu r 0 square. So, this is the wave function and we know that uh, this L square operates on the wave function to give us, give us now I have written out h cross and I have written explicitly uh, h by 2 pi square of that multiplied by j into j plus 1. Okay, this is a Schrodinger equation. Now, I simply okay, uh, divided by your uh, 2i. Let us go back on that a little bit maybe. This is L square. From there we go to Hamiltonian and to get go to the Hamiltonian I have simply divided by what we had in uh, the denominator. We have 2 mu r 0 square. So, that gives us h square by 8 pi square mu 0 square. So, a constant multiplied by j into j plus 1 multiplied by the wave function that is a Schrodinger equation. This is the Eigen value of energy in joule where j is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth as I had said. All right. So, what do we learn from here? 
before going there uh, this is something that I write essentially because I am a spectroscopist. Uh, generally spectroscopists do not want to work with Joule they prefer centimeter inverse especially when working about rotational spectroscopy. So, generally we convert this to epsilon j is equal to h by 8 pi square i c multiplied by j into j plus 1 which is simply multiplying by h c and that is in centimeter inverse and it is simply written epsilon j equal to b into j into j plus 1 centimeter inverse where b is h by 8 pi square i c this is called the rotational constant. So, this is where we are right let us take a look at this first of all uh, b into j into j plus 1 what is the minimum value of j 0 what is the minimum value of energy then 0. So, remember for a quantum harmonic oscillator uh, energy could never be 0 because the oscillator if it is at rest then the position is 0 plus minus 0 x delta x delta uh, p, p x is also uh, 0 plus minus 0. So, delta x and delta p x are both 0 and that violates uncertainty principle which is not allowed. Here what happens is let us say this is my rigid rotor okay, uh, this has a tail let us say this is my rigid rotor. So, it can rotate in any direction th any theta phi can be spanned let us say it has come to rest ok. It is true that uh, the uncertainty in angular momentum is 0. But what is the uncertainty in position for that we will need to know delta theta and delta phi. Well, uncertainty in theta del is well theta can be anything right it can come, come to rest here or here or here anything anywhere. So, uncertainty in theta is effectively infinite of course, it cannot be more than pi, but in that domain that is infinity uncertainty in phi can be again anything between 0 and 2 pi yeah, which is infinity. So, uh, even though uncertainty in uh, angular momentum is 0 uncertainty in the positional coordinates is infinity that is why the day is saved and a uh, quantum rotor rigid rotor can come to rest. Uh, anywhere in space ok uncertainty principle is not violated that is point number 1. So, minimum rotational energy is 0. Now look at this epsilon j equal to b into j into j plus 1 b equal to h by 8 pi square i c. So, what is j uh, what is the next level after 0 j equal to 1 when you put j equal to 1 what do we get Maybe uh, I can just write that the minimum uh, rotational energy is uh, 0 we have written. What happens when uh, maybe we will write like this these j values are already given here is not it. What is the energy corresponding to j equal to 1 energy corresponding to j equal to 1 you can put j equal to 1 here. So, j equal to 1 j plus 1 equal to 2. So, the energy turns out to be 2 b right 2 b. What happens when j equal to 3 you can work that out j equal to 3 j plus 1 equal to 4. So, uh, sorry why did I go to j equal to 3 where well, it is ok uh, 12. So, 12 b. I missed j equal to 2 here for some reason ok. So, uh, you can work out the energies and the values are all written here. Now, let us uh, work out something interesting what is the energy gap between j equal to 1 and j equal to 0 obviously 2 b because this energy is 2 b this energy is 0 difference is 2 b. What is the energy gap between uh, j equal to 2 and j equal to 1 6 b minus 2 b. So, you can write it here the energy gap is 4 b. What is the energy gap between j equal to 3 and j equal to 2 levels 12 b minus 6 b that is 6 b. You see a pattern coming up j equal to 4 and j equal to 3 20 b minus 12 b that is 8 b and j equal to 5 and j equal to 4 
30 b minus 20 b is 10 b ok. Not very difficult to work out really right because what I am trying to work out is delta epsilon for since I am a spectroscopist I always write in terms of spectroscopy j to j plus 1 transition that turns out to be equal to what? You can work it out b into instead of j I will write j plus 2. So, j plus 1 becomes well j plus 1 becomes j plus 2 and j becomes j plus 1 minus b j into j plus 1. So, j plus 1 is common and inside the bracket you have j plus 2 minus j. So, it is 2 b into j plus 1. So, the energy gaps turn out to be uh, 2 b into j plus 1 ok. So, energy gap keeps increasing as you go higher up the ladder in rotational energy manifold. Does it remind you of something? Reminds me of particle in a box that is exactly what happened there also. Now, this has profound implications in rotational spectroscopy. Turns out and uh, I will not derive it here once again it is there in our molecular spectroscopy lectures. Uh, one can work out the selection rule, the selection rule turns out to be delta j equal to plus minus 1 which means that rotational lines in rotational spectra lines will occur at uh, intervals of how much? The first one will occur at 2b corresponding to the uh, delta g equal to plus minus 1 right. So, you can go from 0 to 1 that energy gap is 2b. Then you cannot go from 0 to 2, but you can go from 1 to 2 remember delta g equal to plus minus 1. So, uh, that energy gap is 4b. Then uh, again you cannot go from 1 to 3, you can go from 2 to 3 that energy gap is 6p, the next one is 8p, next one is 10b and so on and so forth. So, what you end up getting is spectra with lines that are equispaced for a rigid rotor. So, what we get is equispaced line spectra. How is that useful? It is useful because that uh, difference in energy is 2b into j plus 1. No, sorry, uh, uh, difference in energy is not 2b into j plus 1, difference in energy is 2b, difference in uh, lines. Uh, difference in energy of lines is essentially 2b. So, once you record a spectrum from the spacing you can work out b and if you work out b then you can work out this, uh, this is b so h is known, pi is known, c is known. So, knowing b you can work out i, i remember is mu r 0 square. Again if you know which molecule you are working with mu is known. So, you can figure out what R0 is. From the spacings you can find out R0. What is R0 for a diatomic molecule? It is a bond length. So, this rotational spectroscopy provides a means for uh, determination of bond length. That is the application of the rigid loader model that we have uh, discussed so far. Of course, it is a simple model, life is not so simple. So, it is very possible that uh, the rotor is not rigid, the molecule while rotating uh, does not keep its bond length constant, but all that uh, comes into the domain of uh, little higher level uh, quantum mechanics and spectroscopy. We will not go into that right now. Uh, it is discussed in our molecular spectroscopy course of course. 
for now we close this discussion but uh, it is not completely over because remember we still have to discuss angular momentum in a little more detail and in doing so we will learn some uh, elegant features of quantum mechanics in the next module.